Okay, hello, this is video lecture number 54. Uh, today we are talking about incorporating the West. For our subsections today, we have uh, cattlemen and miners, homesteaders, and debt and aridity. So as America industrialized, built great cities, attracted millions of immigrants from Europe, and became a world power, uh, a new generation of pioneer farmers came to farm the Great Plains, a large region that stretched from Canada in the north to Mexico in the south, and from the Mississippi Valley in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west. In the years immediately following the Civil War, Cattlemen found that they could turn the grasslands into relatively easy money uh, by grazing their herds on the open range and driving them to the nearest railroad uh, and thence to Eastern Market. In the 1870s, miners poured into the Black Hills uh, where they found uh, deposits of gold in the streams and in the creeks. For farmers, the plains environment posed unusually tough new challenges. Uh, according to historian Walter Prescott Webb, uh, the Great Plains possessed three distinguishing characteristics. They were flat, they were treeless, and they were dry. Rainfall, Webb observed, was insufficient for the ordinary intensive agriculture common to lands of a humid climate. Working this land was incredibly hard. Uh, some farmers succeeded, others failed. <clears throat> the solution, which took decades to work out, was complex and involved new technologies, new farming techniques, uh, irrigation, new laws and public policies, and numerous other adjustments, including, in some cases, abandoning certain lands altogether and, ultimately and critically, uh, generous government subsidies. In the meantime, um, farmers like Howard Rood uh, were very much on their own, uh, and their collective experience eventually produced such widespread agrarian discontent that it gave rise to a remarkable third party movement uh, known as the Populist Party. In a sense, this story of success and failure has repeated itself again and again, uh, most dramatically during the Dust Bowl years, uh, but also in more recent times. Indeed, along the western and more arid half of the grasslands, population continues to shift and decline, leaving some contemporary commentators to doubt whether settlement here on the western Great Plains had not, after all, been a huge and costly mistake. The Rockies, the Sonoran and Mojave Deserts, the Columbia and Colorado Plateaus, uh, um, the Great Basin, the Rio Grande uh, Valley, the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades and the Pacific Slope, uh, these formed the Far West. In this vast and varied region, Anglos, or white Americans, interacted not only with Native Americans, but also with Hispanics, whose ancestors had settled part of the region centuries before. Just as there was a movement in the West to ensure white supremacy uh, through exclusion, reservations, and other means of social control, there was also a determined effort to eliminate significant cultural differences within the Anglo community as well. Utah was refused statehood until the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, the LDS or Mormon Church, a powerful religious force in Utah and the surrounding area, renounced the practice of plural marriage. Um, Howard Rood, uh, who was a young Kansas homesteader, uh, who I mentioned earlier in a letter home to Pennsylvania, a source that we have, uh, describes a typical week on the frontier, and I have access to that source if you're interested in reading it. Um, we also have reports to Congress on the arid character of the American West. We have all kinds of letters uh, and diary entries that explain um, what this countryside was like. Um, we have documents that also contain uh, the Mormon renunciation of polygamy in 1890. Okay, so let's dive a little closer into this, incorporating the West with our very first section, which is cattlemen and miners. So conquest and development of the American West became the domestic foundation for national supremacy in the late 1800s. Uh, farm development was as vital 
as factory development to Republican policymakers. Republicans sought to bring families to the West by offering 160 acres of land each uh, through the Homestead Act. Innovative federal policies such as the U.S. Geological Survey helped in 1879 uh, to open up Western lands managed under the new Department of the Interior. Federal policies also helped to incorporate the Trans-Mississippi West. As railroads crossed the country, thousands of homesteaders filed land claims. To make room for cattle, uh, professional buffalo hunters eliminated the buffalo. Texas ranchers inaugurated the famous Long Drive, uh, hiring cowboys to herd cattle hundreds of miles north to railroads that would eventually push west across Kansas. As soon as railroads reached the Texas range country, though, in the 1870s, ranchers abandoned the Long Drive. Uh, stockyards appeared beside railroad tracks in large Midwestern cities like Chicago. Uh, these places then became the center of a new industry, uh, which was meatpacking. Sheep raising also became a major enterprise in the high country of the Rockies and the Sierras. Uh, in the late 1850s, also as California gold panned out, uh, other mineral discoveries helped to develop the Far West in places like Nevada, the Colorado Rockies, South Dakota's Black Hills, and Idaho. Uh, the Comstock Lode in Nevada was a major silver discovery. <clears throat> At some sites, miners found copper, lead, and zinc uh, and the eastern in that eastern industries demanded. Uh, the insatiable material demands of mining then triggered economic growth at many far-flung sites, such as Pueblo, Colorado, uh, which smelted ore. Remote areas then turned into a mob scene of prospectors, traders, gamblers, prostitutes, and saloon keepers. Uh, prospectors made their own mining codes and often used them to exclude or discriminate against Mexicans, against Chinese, and against blacks. California created a market uh, also for Oregon's produce and their timber. So let's move on and look at homesteaders. Upon first encountering the Great Plains, Euro-Americans thought the land barren and referred to it as the Great American Desert. Uh, railroads, land speculators, steamship lines, and the western states and territories did all they possibly could to encourage settlement of the Great Plains. It was in their financial interest to have people come out. Uh, new technology then, steel plows, barbed wire, and strains of hard kernel wheat uh, helped settlers overcome obstacles. Between 1878 and 1886, settlers experienced exceptionally wet weather. But then the dry weather typical of the Great Plains returned and settlers fled the recently settled lands. Now, something called American fever took hold in Northern Europe as Norwegians and Swedes came to the United States. For some southern blacks, known as exodusters, uh, Kansas was the promised land. By 1880, 40,000 blacks lived in Kansas, uh, the largest concentration of blacks in the West aside from Texas. By the turn of the century, the Great Plains had fully submitted to agricultural development. Uh, in this process, there was little of the pioneering that Americans associated with the westward, westward movement. Farming required money, it required capital investment, and the willingness to risk boom and bust cycles uh, just like any other business. Now, although miners, lumber workers, and cowboys were overwhelmingly men, many women accompanied families as homesteaders. The Republican ideal of national economic development through farm building supported uh, this cultural value of domesticity. Uh, spread wide, widely before and after the Civil War, domesticity held that it was a man's devotion to his wife and children that caused him to work hard and be thrifty and be responsible. Domesticity produced a political clash with the Mormon church, whose adherents practiced polygamy. Along with voting rights, this issue framed gender political controversies uh, during the Reconstruction era. 
Women's rights expanded then, as you know, when Wyoming granted women the right to vote in 1869. Towns in Kansas in the 1880s elected women as mayors and as city professionals. Uh, women were increasingly at this time also leaving the home to go to work. Yet the vast majority of rural women lived under harsh frontier conditions. Uh, Rolvog's contemporary work, uh, Giants in the Earth, portrayed the fear and isolation of Norwegian immigrant women on the Dakota Prairie. So let's look at our next section, debt and aridity. Farm prices dropped in the late 1800s as technological innovation and global expansion glutted markets for wheat, cotton, and corn. <clears throat> Farmers also uh, faced the problem of being small producers in a marketplace that rewarded uh, economies of scale, giving large corporations the advantage of undercutting small uh, farming operations. In the late 1880s, farmers would launch one of the most powerful protest movements in the history of American politics. A hostile environment existed also on the Great Plains in the form of grasshoppers, uh, prairie fires, hailstorms, droughts, tornadoes, blizzards, the lack of water, and minimal wood supplies. Uh, this is a harsh environment. Uh, many families built homes uh, that were completely made of sod. By the late 1880s, over 50,000 homesteaders had fled the Dakotas, and many others gave up their settled lands. Uh, dry farming techniques, though, helped to alleviate some of the challenges of Great Plains farming. But it favored, again, the growth of large corporations. Family farms required over 300 acres at least uh, to survive low prices and harsh weather conditions. So by 1900, about half of the nation's cattle and sheep, one-third of its cereal crops, and nearly three-fifths of its wheat came from the Great Plains. But environmental costs multiplied as wasteful, anti-biodiversity uh, agricultural practices continued. Encouragement from experts like John Wesley Powell, a geologist who explored the West uh, to infuse federal funding into Western development, ignited a debate over corporate versus small family farms. Rampant overdevelopment then led to a preservation movement by Congress. In 1864, Congress gave 10 square miles of the Yosemite Valley to California for public use. In 1872, Congress set aside 2 million acres of Wyoming's Yellowstone Valley as a public park for tourism, uh, a new western industry that was on the rise. Indian eviction accompanied this land preservation. In 1877, the Nez Perce, under Chief Joseph and the Bannock tribe of Indians, utilized Yellowstone for survival as they fled forced reservation life by the federal military. The military decided that killing buffalo would help reduce resistance of the Great Plains tribes. They had signed treaties in 1867 and 1868 to ceded vast tracts of land and remain on reservations. Uh, whites now wanted Indians to cede even more lands. Okay, so that's it for now. Um, this was video lecture uh, number 54, Incorporating the West. So at this time, please answer the, the review questions and continue on with your notes.